Good morning and welcome back. I hope that you are having a great start to your Thursday. This is Money Express and if you're just joining us, you're right in time for press review. Like I promise you, we're going to take a look at some of the local headlines and the international ones and really mince into them and give you a reason to buy your stand copy of the Standard newspaper this morning. I have a great panel with me this morning. Um, De Deki um, Omkuba, I hope I pronounced that right. Omkuba. She is a communication strategist and of course on my father left is Oliver Kipchumba who is an advocate lady and gentlemen thank you so much good morning good morning okay take a look at this our first story of the day um, of course, we're running with this. How the state uh, duped lecturers with 1,000 rise. I will not go through the numbers, but I believe it's important that you grab your copy of the Senate this morning because the lecturer strike has been one thing that has been on the news for quite some time now. And we give you reasons or other figures showing you dating back all the way to 2016 and hopefully the 2021 in regards to their salary increment. But let me bring you your attention rather to one of the biggest stories that happened yesterday. It is the farewell of 47, but where is Patel? Did he even show up for the funeral? Here it is. Big questions. Tears flowed. Uhuru led Kenyans into bidding the victims farewell. But as the coffins were lowered into the mass grave, one question echoed across the land. Where was plantation owner Patel? And why have the wheels of justice been slow on this truck? Oliver, as an advocate. What do you think? Why have the wheels of justice have been so slow on this specific one? 47 people lost their lives. I remember reading that one specific family, one, lost 14 members. I think since it is very unfortunate that we are discussing such issues at such a time, mm. when we ought to ask ourselves, the dam has existed for 20 years. No, nothing was raised before. Where were the NEMA people? who approved the environmental impact assessment before you come even to Patel, the person. The people you, before yeah, Patel. Yeah, you need to ask yourself, what about the public or the civil servants mm -hmm. who approved all this? Because we all know building a dam is not as simple as drilling a borehole. You don't or, wake up in the morning yes, and say, I'm going to build a dam. Because there must be other assessment. You must do the environmental impact. The all NEMA people must approve the thing. And then there's the WARMA, the water and management body. It has a role. But Patel as a person, I think he should be held liable because we have a, an old English case, Ryland versus Fletcher. It is truly applying to him. But even as we discuss that, we need investigation carried out to know the extent of damage. Dams should be inspected annually. Because at times you are told a dam should be drained. Mm. This is such a place called annually, the, the, every dam should be inspected annually to make sure that we are taking care of all these problems. So before even we come to Patel, we are asking where these other regulatory yes. bodies. Where is Warma? Because they are the ones tasked with issues around the dams and any water body. They are the ones who should know its status and whether it should be drained or not. Mm -hmm. And now we come to Patel. As a person, you you should be held liable for those actions. You bring anything into your land, it causes damage, it is your damage. Now the other question, Deke, and I want you to jump into this, is mm -hmm. that um, the Patel family haven't even come out to give a proper form of, 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 should I say, a press statement, saying, sharing their condolences. We didn't even see them yesterday, if they were even there in the first place. Mm -hmm. um, just to show sincerity. You know, they, they haven't even come out like a family spokesman. And even as a communication strategist, you know this is important in any scenario, especially in such a horrific scenario. A family spokesman should have come out and said, listen, we take full responsibility, and here's what we're doing to make sure that the society gets back on its feet. Even a simple communication to the public, they could have owed that to Kenyans. Yeah, it's very true. It's very unfortunate. We, of course, begin by sending our condolences to the families who lost their lives. It's true that Patel, as a family or as a body, because this there is this is a whole group, Solai group, that they should have come up very strongly and offered condolences as well as, you know, uh, being able to say forward what they are planning on doing with regards to compensating the families who lost their loved ones. So it is a very, very unfortunate situation. But, of course, we, you know, we go back to the fact that, uh, as, as Oliver is saying, that this is an an entire situation of people who have not been up to task in as far as their jobs are concerned and 
of course, Patel being the, the end person, you know, uh, who is the owner of this particular dam. So it is very true that he needs to come forward and be able, you know, to take full responsibility for what has happened. You know, the first step is offering condolences to the family, as well as being able to facilitate in, in as far as, you know, our compensation is concerned right. with these people, yes. All right. Let me bring your attention to yet another story, still on Solidam, but I think one that is actually positive. Let me scroll over to page um, three. But before that, I don't, let me bring your attention to this, a bit of international news. I won't go into details with this one because we did discuss it yesterday. If you've been, if you've been following the Palestinian protests, uh, more specifically in Gaza, after what happened in Monday this week when the, pres um, when the capital city was moved from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem. During that specific time, peaceful protests were happening, but um, it didn't turn out to be so peaceful. This has become the deadliest protest in Gaza since 2014. A few images just to give you a painting of how that looks like, right? So it's actually on our second page this morning. But now back to the Solai story that I promised you as something that a bit more positive. Solai hero who saved um, 30 children from death. Um, allow me to just read pro probably um, the first paragraph. It was the end of another typical day for Mary Waruguru, a community health worker in Salina Kuru County. But for some reason, Mary chose to stay a bit longer at the Chelai Clinic to help the doctors attend to patients. That decision would turn out to be one that made a difference between life and death for at least 30 children. I hope I've given you a test bit of why you need to grab your standard, your standard copy this morning and why this is a, quite an inspiring story. So lie heroine who has saved 30 children from death. Um, Deki, I want you to jump on this one as well. Mm -hmm. Out of oh. every bad story, there's a silver lining. Yes, it's very true. Of course, we say congratulations to Mary. I think what happens is that when circumstances like this do come up, when people lose their lives or on the verge of losing their lives, mm -hmm. the human side of people always tends to kick in and there are people who put their lives on you know on the line in an attempt to save others which is something that is very noble that she has done in this particular case bearing in mind that these were children you know whose lives were, were in danger and she went out of her way to be able to offer that needed support right. and so we say congratulations to her you know and we continue to wish their families well all right mm -hmm. um uh, of course, for those who lost their lives, may they rest in peace. And for their families, um, we still stand with them. Let's head over to page four. Page four this morning. So there we go. County chiefs to lose guards. Now, last week, one of our top stories within the local dailies, more specifically the Standard, we were telling you why Cabinet Secretary of Interior, Fred Matiangi, wants to slash police VIPs, or rather police for VIP members. In Kenya, we have about one police to every 1,000 um, Kenyan, quite too much beyond what the UN recommends. And this is a follow-up to that. Governors are set to lose half of their armed bodyguards as the government scales down the number of police officers assigned for VIP protection. This came as it emerged that some private ranches have up to 200 armed officers who are paid by the state. Oliver, here you are having some people who have about 200 armed officers, yet there are people, we have about one to 1,000 being a ratio of police officers to Kenya, ones who pay um, you know, taxes in the country, and the sort of the security they get seems like a backwash for them. Mm -hmm. I think we must begin by also commending the cabinet secretary, Ms. Dr. Matiangi, mm -hmm. for doing a commendable job and for being doing something that most of his predecessors have, uh, were afraid to do or could not do. The question we need to ask ourselves is this. Most of our governors are in the villages. Who will attack a governor in the village? Why do you give a governor up to 12 armed guards or armed policemen? The question is, in the village there, nobody has even time to think about having a governor. So doing well, with even four yeah. is enough. Yes, four. Come to the ranches. We have very able private security firms in this country. If For you us, need, yes. yeah, if you need to have 200 armed policemen in your farm, get G4S or any other farm outside here. But if we need to attain the 1 to 450, the recommended ratio, we need to free most of these policemen from guarding ranches, governors. Because take an example today, when a governor works 
into a room, he walks with a crowd of around 20 people. A half of that crowd are armed policemen who are paid by the taxpayer to do what? To just follow the governor, just do all manner of things, go to their chambers and supervise their work. Okay. We need to know that a position of leadership is not a position of entitlement and privilege. It is a call to serve. Wow. It's not, a, it's not a title to entitlement. Yes. It's not a position to entitlement. To paint for you a bigger image, um, Deki, listen to this. About 12,000 officers are assigned uh, to VIPs not, as drivers and bodyguards and messengers. Uh, why do we have personal assistance then? All right. And um, we, what Cabinet Secretary Fred Matangi says that after he made this announcement last week, that he plans to scale them down um, by half within two months. Do you have confidence that Matiangi wouldn't just talk, that he would actually do this? And in two months, we'll be having a different conversation of he will instead of he has done. Yeah, I think that when it comes to Dr. Matiangi, we can use the theory of predictive, you know, analysis that we have seen him, you know, follow up with his word. And when it comes to this, then we definitely expect that he would follow up with his word. I mean, these are the excesses of power that sometimes when people get these positions, then there are so many things that they are disposed to, you know, in terms of benefits that sometimes are counterproductive where we, with, you know, with regards to where we want to go as a nation. So I think that it is about time that some of these things are scaled down so that we can be able to sustain our ourselves as a nation and so that we can be able to be productive because if we are not productive at the end of the day if we just heap up too much you know in a certain you know group of people and certain positions then that's why we are having a lot of problems and people tending to gravitate towards these positions of power because they are no longer places to serve but there it almost looks like it's a place to mint the taxpayer all right so page mm -hmm. six again I won't go into details because we've already discussed it but that's where you can find our top story this morning Patel keeps off the Salai dump Victims Funeral Service. Paragraph 2 says not even Patel, the chairman of the Salai group of companies who had 24 hours earlier consoled with the families of the victims attended the interdominational funeral service at Salai AIC Church Grounds. I'll let you grab a copy of the standard this morning. We even give you past disasters going all the way back to Huruma. Remember Huruma back in 2016? We, pull, we spell all that down for you in regards to past disasters. But let's head over now to a different page this morning. And um, on page six, seven rather, TSC to hire over 8,000 teachers. Oliver, do you think this is the answer when it comes to the, the current lecturer strike that we are seeing within the country that has been running for now months that has crippled an entire education ministry in the highest level, university? While hiring the 8,000 teachers might be seen as bridging the gap, we have a lot of problems that continue continue to persist within the education sector. The lecturer strike, all those shenanigans Even around. Even high school lecturers. Yes. And the issue of quality of education. If a strike persists for more than a month, that in itself delves into the quality of education and it goes deeper to the issue of you have you have students being in school for five years mm -hmm. instead of the normal four. And this has it in itself social effects to the society whereby they will be drunk and disorderliness, students tend to be on rampage on other matters. Okay. I think, one, we, this will increase the issue of transition from primary to secondary, because as you can see, most of these teachers mm. will be absorbed at secondary school Ex level. Yeah, and majority the, of them. Majority of them will be absorbed at that level. And then the other issue will be also, will be to expand the infrastructure around there. But even as we talk about increasing teachers, we should also look at the quality uh -huh. of the teachers coming on board. Right. And quality goes to even issues like remuneration, compensation, and all this. Let, let's have a discussion whereby the public sector, or TAC, attracts the best. Of the best. And out of those 8,000 lecturers, about 7,672 will be taken to secondary schools and about 1,000 will be fixed in primary schools. Speaking of what Oliver has said in terms of also quality, those applying for primary um, teaching jobs must at least hold a P1 certificate, while those seeking secondary school jobs must have diploma qualifications and above. This still happens as the lecturer strike is still ongoing. But now let's head over to page 8. One of the biggest stories, and I, and I want to bring Deck into this one as a communication strategist who, who signed on um, the new cyber crime, crime regulation. People have had mixed feelings in regards to it, others saying that this is going to um, sort of infringe press freedom or other freedom of expression. 
on the other side, it also curbs cyberbullying, child pornography. So if, what do you think about this? Is it a win for Kenya's um, cybersecurity um, sector? Yeah, I think that there is an extent to which we have to put policies in place and laws in place where the cyber, you know, uh, is concerned. The truth of the matter is that digital uh, life is continuing to grow and grow. And as some of these things grow, then the policies have to catch up with them, you know, and put them in place mm -hmm. so that we can be able to have some checks and balances. There are things that in the law that are extremely good because, you know, there was need and there was need to curb some of these things and be able to, you know, let people know that there are consequences to some of of these things but the truth of the matter is that uh, the digital space is very mutative and you know this is going to lead you know to so many dynamics when it comes to some of these laws in as far as you know uh, the, the the position of uh, there's a lot of freelancing in terms of uh, the people who put out information uh, on the cyber space and so you know in days to come I think that it will be interesting to see how this thing will pan out all right Oliver your thoughts in regards to that I think the law, the law is welcome because in every every new thing there is a place we must have a place a point of start, mm -hmm. and as such, the new law is well is good for the simple reason that we have had over a long time the growth of social media, and uh, with the growth of social media came cyberbullying. It came also the issue of breaking even wrong news and all manner of news. So with that, we needed to have some, some demarcation of the field. But having said that, I must also address myself to the issue of freedom of media and speech. It must not be at any point, we must not view this act as, as clamping down on that which right. the Constitution has already given us. Right. And moving forward, I believe there are some parts of the act which might suffer the same fate with the security amendment law. All right, let's see how that turns out, because even the punishment there, you could be liable to go to jail and also pay a fine close to 5 million Kenyan shillings. Let me bring your attention now to um, the Daily Nation. Their biggest headline is Satro Teach Raila Team Ajiz Uhuru Kenyatta. <clears throat> Let me just read a quote from Salem David. He says President Kenyatta has been talking about cracking the whip um, and business unusual. This uh, is time to. He, this is the time to walk the talk, and uh, all the officers around this issue must step down to allow full investigations. This is quite interesting because even today, we are, what we are going to be looking at, my colleague uh, Michael Gitonga, is the issue of how are we even as common Monaichi curbing corruption. Uh, this being the last term um, for President Uhuru Kenyatta, Deki, what would you do? You think that he will fully come out in terms of fighting corruption the way Kenyans have hoped he would since 2013? I think it is important that he does so, and not just doing so in word, mm -hmm. but it has to be seen in deed, yes. you know, so that, you know, moving forward and in years to come, we begin to understand as Kenyans and especially as people who take up positions of power where they manage a lot of, you know, the resources by the, by the, by the citizens, that it becomes important and imperative for them to understand that corruption is a no-go zone. And for us to be able to move forward, we have to get to a point that we curb this entire issue of corruption, begin from the very top leadership so that we do not see issues of excesses and people you know just taking advantage of course with what we already are seeing in the NYS and there are so many you know scandals that are going on and you know issues to deal with corruption that if we just allow and not we I'm talking about leadership in this particular mm -hmm. place and the president is top on the list that if we just allow things to slip by then at the end of the day we will not be productive at any time we'll begin to accommodate corruption in ways that will not be beneficial for us Oliver mm -hmm. I think to or to just begin with, since Mudavadi should not be the one telling us about corruption. Just two days ago, his former PS, Mr. Kirui, was yes. was jailed for the Mavoko Cemetery issues. Mm -hmm. So I think he lacks the moral fiber to lecture us and going back to issues of Golden Bank. But having said that, as a Kenyan, he has a right and to demand for those answers. But also, we must cut slack the president. We must cut him some slack. One. We, we are still discussing the NYS scandal, and we have seen what has been done by the various state agencies. The, D, the new DCI, the DPP, it has been, the investigation has been going on from the state. So I think it is, we must give him that he's doing something in the fight of corruption. It is under his regime that even a PS has been arraigned in court and jailed. 
So we should be able to look at it from that perspective. And even there is something from the tough talk, there is something happening. Although it is on a smaller scale, much will be done. But as, as, as I said earlier, we must have a point to begin. And calling for sacking of Rotich in itself might not help. Right. We called for the sacking of the top management in NYS. What happened? The middle level management continued embezzling public funds. So we must also ask for the sweeping of the room and not the door. Mm. Rotich is just the door. Let us ask those people who are culpable. If it is NYS, go to the mid-level manager, deal with him. If it is in the Mavoko scandal, deal with it decisively. But I must say that we are it is baby steps we are taking, but we are taking them in the right direction. Oliver, as an advocate, I would love to hear your thoughts today on our Twitter poll question where we are asking what can we as Kenyans, common Wananchi, do in, uh, as our role, really, at um, tackling corruption? First of all, Zinzi, you must realize that corruption is in, no, is in itself not like rain. It doesn't just appear. Mm. It begins somewhere. When to, today you are just driving along Mombasa Road, you have a traffic offense, you bribe. It must begin from us. It must be a, a push from us and not the law. No matter the magnanimity of laws we have on corruption, if the drive is not from us, we need a social reengineering as a people. We need that culture. Travel to some countries in the world and you will realize that honesty is part of it. Go to Israel. A person is not even asked to pay fair. You pay on your own volition. So honesty must be inculcated in our DNA. It must be part of our social fiber. Right. Without laws, because at the end of the day, you might have a lot of laws, corruption this, corruption that, and we must not also look at leaders as being corrupt. Those leaders are a, are a reflection of what we are as society. We must ask ourselves, if the three of us are not corrupt, who is this corrupt person? It means... <laughs> It begins with us. Yeah. All right. Thank you. That's where we're going to stop press review today. That is Oliver um, Kipchumba, who is an advocate. And closer to me is um, Deki Omkuba, who is a communication strategist helping us go through the local dailies today. So grab your copy of the standard and you can get all the latest details. In fact, we've also covered Markel's wedding, Meghan Markel's wedding, which is upcoming. And we tell you why the father will not be making it for that specific wedding. When we come back from this short commercial break, Michael Gitonga will take you through the state of the nation.